This morning, we are going to continue our BLESS series. I like to keep us understanding what BLESS is. It's an evangelism idea, a sharing our faith idea that begins with what? I didn't get that very well. It begins with what? Now, the next one, if you've been listening, you'll know what the next one is. What is it? Listen. Begin with prayer and what? Listen. E in BLESS stands for something we all like to do. Let's say that louder. Eat. Begin with prayer, listen, eat. We're going to know this stuff really well. It's how we share our faith with people. See, as we pray for people, as we listen to them, as we share a meal with them. S is about serving. So let's say that word together. What was the L? I'm going to see if you guys are listening to me. And the final S is sharing our story or sharing our faith. Begin with prayer, listen, eat with people, share a meal. That's what we're going to be talking about today, why that's such a powerful thing in our society and in our lives. Serve and share our faith, share our story. Wherever you are in the process of reaching someone who needs Christ's love, you are guaranteed to be able to do one of those things. Amen? Let's do that again. Wherever someone is in your life that needs the love of Jesus, you are able to do one of those things. Amen? Amen. Yes, we are. And once we do that, we start realizing we're part of the process of sharing Christ with others. You see, the world has this concept that Christians are going to just walk up to them and are just going to start telling them something. And the problem with that is when we do that, people put up resistance, they put up their defenses, and they don't listen to us. So the Bible has ways to effectively share our faith, and that's what we're talking about. We invite Pastor Josie to come forward as she shares on this wonderful, beautiful Mother's Day our opportunity to understand the value and power of how God uses our eating together to help change and transform lives. one of the three pastors here at Faith Community Church. On uh, Sundays at this time, I'm usually in our Zoom room, and I am uh, with Regina Cushing moderating this. So um, anybody who's online today, here I am. I'm up front today. Um, It's wonderful to be here and to see you. And it is a beautiful day. I was expecting rain today, so it was really nice to to wake up and to uh, see the sunshine. So like Stan said, we are continuing today this whole idea of a sermon series relating to how we share our faith. How do we reach others with the love of Jesus? How do we do that in a world that's a little bit different and that's constantly changing? You know, there's a lot of things that we do on a regular basis, like eat. You know, we all like to eat. We all have to do it several times a day. How can we take those simple, mundane, everyday things and elevate them to something more? How can we use those things that we do already and use them as opportunities to share the love of Christ? I'm uh, taking a great class right now called Missional Formation in a Global Era. And I wasn't quite sure what that was going to look like, but it ended up, or I'm still in the middle of it, I got a final left to do, I think all my papers are done. Um, It is a, a class that's talking about the changing world. Now, we know that the world has changed in part because of COVID, but the world is constantly changing anyway, right? That's one thing that we can always be certain of. The world changes. And so this class is giving me a lot of ideas and trying to teach us how to react in this new and changing world. How do we reach people in a global community, in in the face of global Christianity? And, you know, right now, more than ever, we're really tasked with the job of spreading the love of Christ and spreading the word of God into the entire world. Sometimes with people who look differently than we do, some people um, maybe worship differently than we do. And let's face it, you know, we are not spending our entire weeks within the confines of this church building. You know, we spend an hour, maybe a little bit more, um, a week here. But then the rest of our lives, the rest of our days, the rest of our week is spent out there in the world. And so how can we leverage the time that we have, 24 hours, seven days a week, 
How can we leverage that time for God? How can we use our time most effectively to reach out to people? And so we've been learning about the power of prayer. So that's something that we do already. So how do we leverage that? How do we use that to pray for our neighbors? How do we pray for people who, like Stan had mentioned, they might not even know we're praying for them? How do we take a walk in our neighborhood and maybe use that opportunity to pray for the people, the houses that live in the houses as we go by? How do I, at school, use that moment of silence that we do at the beginning to pray for students or to pray for teachers? How do we use something that we already do and elevate it to something higher? And we talked about listening. Now, listening is something that we should all be doing. Probably most of us need to learn to do it better. We're so uh, quick to walk through our lives. We're busy. we got places to go. We're focused. Put our heads down. How can we find those opportunities during our week to maybe raise our eyes up, maybe stop and pause? I was leaving here the other day, uh, maybe Friday or something maybe, and I was thinking about rushing home. I had work to do, a paper to write, sermon to finish, and somebody was in the parking lot and stopped and said hello and was walking towards the car, and my first instinct was to duck inside my car and go because I had so much to do. But, you know, it kind of struck me. It's like, all right, I stopped, I shut the door, and I leaned against the car, and I spent five or so minutes talking with this individual But what a great time. It was a blessing for me, and and hopefully it was a blessing for the other person because I took this moment that happens in our lives every single day, and I used it to be a little bit more Christ-like. And so today, we're talking about the power of eating together. You know, we all have to eat, like we said. How do we use that to be something more? So when Rick and I first moved into our present house in Plymouth about 13 or so years ago, the first thing we did was go out and look for the biggest table that we could find to fit on our back deck. I love eating outside, love being outside, so that was the first thing we did. And I think we went and ended up at BJ's or something like that, and we ended up with this great huge table that has a tile top, and it was heavy, and there's no way we could bring it up the stairs of my back deck, because my back deck is high. And at the time, Rick was really involved with the youth group, my oldest daughter. Megan was involved with the youth group. I don't know, Paul, if you were there when we did this, but we called on the youth group, all these guys to come and lift this big, huge table and, and put it on my back deck. And it's still there. We've, we've fixed it. We've retiled it. We've done all kinds of things with it. Because Rick and I recognize the importance of having space for people to gather around a table. Now, you know, between Rick and I, we have seven kids. And so quite often that table is filled or was filled anyway with our own children. Then you add a couple youth group people, you add a couple friends. And it was always a place where we had a lot of fun. And, you know, admittedly, it got crazy sometimes. You know, there was probably a food fight once or twice or three or four times maybe that, you know, I may have, you know, not only not put a stop to, but perhaps kind of been a part of a little bit too, you know, but it's fun. It was fun. Meal times were more than just about the food that we were putting into our mouths. It was a time to build relationship. And, you know, when the kids were younger, I was always a real stickler in my family for um, sitting together at the, the dinner table and we didn't have a TV. We didn't eat in front of the TV. Cell phones would get turned off or turned upside down. Uh, There was even a time when we had a basket by our front door, right? And when people would come over for dinner, you know, the, the cell phones went into the basket because we didn't want distractions. It was important for us to share that time together. Now, in full honesty, as children have kind of moved away, Um, we've lost that in my house, and I miss that. I was talking to a couple people after the last service, and one person in particular was telling me it's just her and her husband and one adult child, and they still eat dinner together every night. So, you know, I felt a little badly about that. I'm thinking I might need to, to work a little harder. And, you know, part of it is that the kids have moved away. Uh, we have our 17-year-old, our almost 17-year-old home, and You know, he just got his license six months ago, so he's out and about. We never quite know what his schedule is these days. And, you know, sometimes it's just Rick and I. And, you know, quite honestly, there are times when we sit at the uh, coffee table in the living room and we eat our dinner together in front of the TV. And, 
You know, I miss those times. But, you know, we still do it. We still do get together and have meals together. It doesn't happen every day like it used to. But when it does happen, it's powerful and it's important and it's special. And when somebody asks me, you know, what do you want for your birthday? What do you want to do for Mother's Day? It's always, let's just get together and have a meal. Let's go out to eat or let's, you know, let's have the kids over and let's have, you know, dinner or brunch or something together because it's a time for us to reconnect. It's a time for us to uh, refill ourselves with the love of family and friends. And that's an important time. Um, some of the best conversations happen when we're around the dinner table, you know, and in the car. I don't know if any other parents out here can experience that, but wonderful conversations when you're driving your kids in the car. But, you know, at the dinner table, I don't know if it's because, you know, people have their mouths full and so they can't be talking back and forth. You know, maybe they listen a little bit more. But nonetheless, time around the dinner table is a time where relationships are built. It's a time when relationships are strengthened and nurtured. And it's a time when we can spread and embody the love of God simply by doing something as mundane and as routine as having a meal together. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about why is it that sharing a meal together is so powerful? Why is it so important? So let's just take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to be together. We thank you for your presence, your Holy Spirit in this room today. We thank you for each person who is here, who is here in person in the sanctuary, and who is home online joining us today. Just ask that you would lend your blessing to this message, that each one of us could empty our hearts and our minds of any distraction, any heaviness that we walked in here with, Lord, and just put it aside. We can pick it up later when we walk out that door. Just open us up to your message. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So our scripture today is the wedding feast at Cana. You're going to find that in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So if you have a device with you that you want to follow along, or um, if you have a Bible with you, John chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 11, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, it had now become wine, and he didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So it's no coincidence that Jesus chose the context of a meal to manifest his first miracle. It's something that we should have our attention drawn to. This was the first. This was something that John chose to put in there as the first thing that he did. You know, like I said in verse 11, you know, the first of his signs it manifests his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Jesus was just beginning to gather his disciples, and he was in this opportunity, in this place, in this meal that he had been invited to, and this is where he chose to manifest his glory for the very first time. Now, we know as we read through the scriptures, through the gospels, that Jesus ate with people often, over and over and over again. There are many, many stories within the gospels of Jesus eating with other people. Now, sometimes he fed them. You know, you look at the story of feeding the 5,000, for example. Sometimes he was invited into the homes of other people. In Luke, there's a story of him being invited into the home of a Pharisee to dine. 
And sometimes he invited people in to dine with him. Think about the example of the Last Supper, where he invited his disciples to come and have a meal with him in the upper room. And he did this because Jesus understood the power of eating together. He understood that there was something special, something that transcended the normal and the ordinary, something that happens when you share a meal together. And so I want to look at a few things today that kind of helps us understand why is it so powerful? And in understanding that, how can we use that ourselves? You know, we have to have three meals a day, maybe a, a coffee, a snack, a, a dessert. You know, we have a lot of opportunities to eat and to share. So how can we use these times that happen every single day and leverage them, like I said, for something that's greater than that? So the first thing that I want to mention is that eating a meal together is a holistic experience. It's not just feeding the physical. It's not just feeding the spiritual. It's something that does both. It's a both and. It's not an you know, either or. It's a both and. It can do both things together. There are times when we feel physically empty and spiritually empty. And when we look at the scripture today, you know, we read that the wine had run out. They have no more wine. This is a wedding feast, a feast that we know would have been going on for a week. And they had run out of wine. They had run out of something that was a physical thing. But chances are, there was also some spiritual um, deficits going on there. We know that Jesus came because of that. We know that Jesus came to fill us spiritually. So there was physical needs that needed to be filled, physical emptiness, and there was also spiritual emptiness that happens, just as it does in our very own lives. And eating together kind of fills both of those things. It fills us physically. It fills us spiritually. Sometimes we do one or the other. It doesn't have to be either or, but sometimes, you know, we're focused on doing a Bible study or we're doing um, baskets for Easter, or we're feeding the homeless, or we are, you know, here in the sanctuary being spiritually fed. You know, I love the fact that we have home groups. Home groups are a great time to do both things. You know, we, we pray a little bit, we, we study the word a little bit, and then we have a delicious dessert that somebody brings. So it's holistic. It takes care of all of our needs, and Jesus understood that. Um, last week, David had spoken about uh, Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's basically this concept that there are some basic needs that all human beings share that need to be filled before we can go up any higher, before anything else can get done, before any other needs can get filled. We need to, to just take care of those physiological needs of people. So, you know, food, drink, warmth, shelter, those are the things that need to be taken care of first before we can go into any higher realms. And there's no better example that I can think of than the elementary school that I work in. So I work at Hedge Elementary in North Plymouth, and um, I have the pleasure and the privilege of being able to be with the students for breakfast, um, which amazingly, I just, just, this came to me prior to covid uh, breakfast was something that maybe we'd have eight to ten students come to in the morning. Uh, breakfast on Friday at Hedge Elementary School was 110 kids coming in and out, right? So there is a need that is being filled, um, and that's a really good, pretty good example, actually. I'm glad I thought of that. A pretty good example of, of the whole physical and, you know, the, the uh, relational needs of these kids. Anyway, um, it is a time when we are getting these kids ready to face the day. We don't know what happened before. We don't know what happened the night before. But in that moment, we can give them a good breakfast before they set off and do the rest of the things that they do during the day. And it's the same thing with lunch. You know, some kids come with a lunch. Some kids don't. You know, they eat the school lunch, whatever. Um, but it's this time where we can fill their physiological needs so that they can go and do something else. And I was having a conversation with a, a friend of mine whom I work with, and, you know, there are times when, um, you know, we might slip a kid an, an extra muffin, or, you know, they've had a bagel, but they really would like to take a Pop-Tart. It's not always that healthy. I, I get that. But, you know, maybe they don't have a snack, so they, they need an extra Pop-Tart to 
put in their backpack for later. And, you know, normally they're only supposed to take one, but my friend Carrie and I were saying, it's like, yeah, you know that there's just some kids who, you know, just need a little extra. And same thing at lunchtime, you know. They, they open up their lunchbox, they decide they don't like what they see. Yeah, there are some kids that will open up the lunch line back for them um, and give them their, you know, grilled cheese sandwich or whatever it happens to be. Because we understand the importance of feeding them and filling them physically. But then when you go beyond that, you start talking about the need for relationship. And that's also what happens as we have breakfast and we have lunch at Hedge Elementary School and any other school. We feed them. We sit with them, and we talk with them, and it's amazing. You know, the teachers don't have the opportunity to do that, and, you know, sometimes the lunchroom is absolutely chaos, but I consider it such a privilege to be able to have this unstructured time with my students, to be able to sit, and, you know, they're eating, and it's like, what's going on with your day? What, what happened over the weekend? How are things going? You're, you're not sitting with your best friend today. What's happening? So even at school, these mealtimes have become holistic. They become something that, em that fills the emptiness that people have both physically and relationally and emotionally, spiritually. And we look at even just fellowship time at church, right? When we had this pandemic, all that stopped. Now we quickly were able to continue with this part of things, right? We weren't meeting in person, but we were meeting online. And we had Bible studies online, and we had groups online, and we even tried some fellowship online, but it wasn't the same, right? We really missed the coffee hour. We really missed fellowship time. We really missed those times on Monday, Thursday, when we would have a soup and sandwich meal together, because there is something special and sacred about sitting around a table together and sharing a meal, and it fills more than just your physical needs. It fills that need for relationship, and it fills that spiritual need at, at, as well. And it's the same thing in our own lives. You know, like I talked about having my kids come home for meals, and my oldest daughter, Megan, is home this weekend. And uh, I'd like to say she came home for Mother's Day, but I think it was more because there was a Kentucky Derby party yesterday. Um, I think more than one, actually, that she went to with work and with friends. But nonetheless, she's here, and I'm so excited that I get her home for, for Mother's Day. And when I picked her up on whatever day she came in, Thursday, and she was freezing. She's standing there. She's like, Mom, what's going on? I left Miami. She lives in Miami. Left Miami. It was 85 and sunny, and she shows up in Plymouth, and it's like 45 and cloudy. I'm like, honey, you've only, been, you've only lived in Miami for less than a year. You should remember this. Um, but, you know, after, after turning on the seat warmers in the car, you know, when we got home, the first thing I did was go through the fridge, and I'm, you know, pulling out the chickpeas and the salad and the chicken, and, you know, I'm making her a cup of tea because it's a time when I'm going to reconnect with my daughter, and we're going to do that as we're having a meal together because there's just something special about sharing a meal together. I was also thinking... Um, you know, we're a little bit, Rick and I are a little beyond the whole boyfriend-girlfriend of our children's stage, but when, when we were in the midst of that stage, you know, one of the, the uh, signs of a person being accepted into our family or, or really kind of elevating, you know, all the stages of dating um, was coming to our house for dinner. And sometimes that was like a dreaded thing, like, oh my goodness, I'm not ready to invite so-and-so over to our house for dinner. And, you know, it could have very well been because of the possibility of the food fights that sometimes happened around my table or, you know, the craziness of having everybody around. But I think it's something more than that, too. There's a level that gets reached when somebody comes over to dinner because that kind of goes to my next point. There's, there's something about being around the dinner table that's very familial, doesn't matter who you're eating with, doesn't matter if it's a stranger, a friend, a family member, there's something that kind of levels the playing field when you're sitting around a dinner table. It puts you all on the same level and it feels like family. For that period of time that you happen to be together, your family, your relationships are on a different level than just people you're passing in the street or talking to out in the parking lot. And we sometimes miss the, the relationship building qualities of having a meal together because we're busy. You know, I don't know about the rest of you, but there is uh, probably more than once during the week when I'm leaving school 
and I'm grabbing a Starbucks coffee and a, you know, a spinach feta wrap at uh, Starbucks, and I'm going and eating it in my car, and I'm going on to do something else. And, you know, we also have this tendency, especially with COVID, to, to kind of isolate ourselves a little bit. And we forget. We've forgotten how important and how life-giving and how family-oriented sitting around a table and sharing a meal is because there's so much more to it than just the physical act of putting food in your stomachs. You know, we know we need to do that, but sharing a meal together is so much more. Now, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Does anybody here watch Downton Abbey? Oh, thank goodness. All right. In, in one of the last services, people were like, they didn't really want to admit that they watched it. Um, it's Rick, Rick and my uh, new favorite uh, binge-watching show, and um, you know, Rick has been known to have nightmares because of something that's happening on the show. We get very involved with this show. Um, but one of the things I've noticed with that show is that there's a lot of scenes of people eating together. Now, if you're not familiar with the show, it takes place in England. It's about pre-World War I. We're, we're in the middle of the 1920s right now in the show, and it's very hierarchical. So we've got lords and ladies that eat in the house, and then we've got, you know, the servants that eat down below. And even the servants split each other up. You know, the, the uh, valets don't eat with the uh, footmen. And the cooking help doesn't eat with the chef. And it's very staggered. And so what does it matter? I mean, we, we come into contact with people every single day that are different than us. But there's something about sitting down to a meal that just kind of changes changes things a little bit, right? It, it puts us on a level that is sometimes, or was at least sometimes, uncomfortable. And in this show, there is a, a gentleman who kind of spans, right? He was the, the, sh the chauffeur, and he marries into the family, and he doesn't know where to go. You know, he doesn't know whether to sit upstairs or sit downstairs, and it's, nobody knows how to react to him because there's something about sitting around a table that kind of puts us on the same level. And for a society that was very hierarchical, that was very uncomfortable. They didn't know how to manage that. It's because the dinner table just puts us as part of family. And we know that in Jesus' day, people didn't dine out of their social class. You know, people had meals with people who were within their social class and not anything more than that. And, you know, Jesus was constantly scandalized for that because he ate with people who others considered unclean, who others considered to be sinners, unlike they themselves. And Jesus was constantly scandalized for that. Lots of stories of it, but just Matthew uh, 9 says, And as Jesus reclined at a table in the house, behold, many tax collectors excuse me, and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Tax collectors and sinners. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, Why does your teacher eat? with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus was being accused and was being seen by these Pharisees as lowering himself to eat with these other people. Because eating together implies something deeper than just sharing food. There's a, there's a generosity in serving the meal. There's a, a vulnerability and a, a humility in accepting the meal together. And there's an identification. When you're sitting across the table, you are identifying with the people that you are sitting with. And so that can be uncomfortable. And Jesus was constantly being mocked and ridiculed and, and uh, uh, accused of doing something wrong when he did that. But we know that that was his whole point of coming, right? His whole point of coming was to identify with us, to identify with all people. And we see it in the Last Supper, you know, when he chose to wash the feet of the disciples in the context of a meal, he was showing them through his actions that he came to serve and not to be served. He took this, this normal everyday thing that people did eat together, and he used that as a chance to show what it meant to be God. And so that brings me to my last point. point the whole idea that eating a meal together elevates something simple to something sacred. It takes a very simple act of just having sustenance, and it elevates it to something that is so much more than that. And in the Last Supper, Jesus took these common elements, bread and wine, these, 
these life, physically life-giving elements, and he elevated them into spiritual life-giving elements. He elevated the simple to the sacred. I was thinking about that when I walked in today, and you know, you may have noticed our, our coffee bar out there, and I, was, uh, I walked up to it, and Azekai was behind, and I went to go and give myself a cup of coffee, and I realized that the, all the coffee pots were pointed towards him. And I was like, oh, as we don't serve ourselves? And he said, no, this is you know, a chance to serve you. It's a cup of coffee. But he served me. And it was, it was just, it was an amazing thing because he took something as simple as the having of a cup of coffee and he showed me what it was like to be like Christ by the simple act of serving me a cup of coffee. And so we talk about Mother's Day today and, you know, Mother's Day in bed, uh, breakfast maybe, you know, burnt toast that your kids sit on the bed with you and, you know, they eat off your plate because you're not going to get it for yourself or, or eggs that end up being, you know, a little bit too seasoned or, you know, you have a tea party with your kids and you're having water in teacups and, and crackers. It's not about the food, right? That food, because of the interaction you're having, has been elevated to something sacred and something so much more important. I was also thinking, like I said, you know, I don't have dinners around my own dinner table with all my kids the way we used to, but many of my kids have moved out and have started their own families and, or their own homes. And so I've had the opportunity to go to my daughter Megan's house, and she makes me a meal, or go to my son Ryan's house over in Los Angeles and, you know, have my son make me a meal. It doesn't matter what he cooked. Doesn't matter what Kaylin and Johnny made for me when we went over there uh, for her baby shower. It didn't matter because that action of eating was elevated to something more simply by the fact that we were sharing that time and sharing that meal together. Just looking at the scripture, you know, the scripture tells us there were six water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Let's not forget that. Let's not miss that. Water jars there for purification. Those were jars that were going to be used to wash the feet of people who were coming. These were, uh, when you think about the Jewish rites of purification and the laws of purification, these were jugs that were being used, filled with water, to wash people's feet. You know, you don't get much more um, simple and basic than that. But then the scripture goes on to tell us that, you know, Jesus tells the serpents, draw some water out and take it to the master and find that the water has become wine. The mundane has become miraculous. The water has been transformed into something sacred. From water that was meant to clean the feet of the people coming in, changed into wine that eventually becomes known as the wine that washes away the sin of the world, the blood of Christ that washes away our sin. The simple and the mundane and the everyday gets elevated to something sacred when it's done in community and when it's done together. And so we learn through this and through our other um, messages that we've had in this series that there are many ways to share our faith. There are many ways to embody Jesus Christ. So I always, when I do a Bible study or anything, I always want to think about, you know, what's our takeaway? What is it that you're going to walk out those doors with? And that's what I hope you walk away with today, that there are many ways to do that. And you don't need to preach. You don't need to preach about Jesus in order to embody Christ, to share the love of Christ. You know, it's interesting, my brother also lives in Miami, and he's, he's not a practicing Christian, but the other day he sent me a YouTube video, and he's really into music, and I, don't know, I think he's got like 10 guitars in his house, all different kinds, and he loves it. And so he sent me this little YouTube video about an artist, I don't remember, a guy named John, I think. And it was an interview with him, and this guy, John, was talking about the fact that he, he um, thinks it's wrong that the media elevates artists, elevates musical figures, um, as if the music came only from them. And so this guy was saying there's something more to it. There's something in nature. There's something in, in the spiritual that, that has, to be, has to be there in order for the music to come out. And so I had to kind of chuckle, and I was like, yeah, that's God. You know, the name of God wasn't spoken in that exchange. But you knew that that was what they were talking about. There's something more than us. There's something beyond us. So the name of God doesn't even need to be preached. Not at the beginning. 
Maybe that comes later. You know, I was reading in Romans chapter 1, says, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. The presence of God is felt in all the simple things that we do. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be a grandiose gesture. Doesn't need to be a four-course meal. Can be as simple as a cup of coffee that was served to me as I walked into church today. Evangelism and spreading our faith and spreading the nature of God is about making a place that people feel comfortable and that people feel welcomed and that people feel that they belong. That is how we embody God. That is how we show the love of Christ to the people. And that is how we bring it out to our neighbors in the world around us. You know, I'm fond of the whole concept of Monday is coming. And that's the whole idea that, you know, we have this little bit of time that we're here together. You know, we're in these walls. And then we walk out. We've got a whole week that we need to deal with. We've got a whole week of time, a whole week of people that we're going to come into contact with a whole week of opportunities that we have to spread Jesus in a world that needs it. How do we do that? How do we do the things that we do all the time? And we do that because God is not just about doing missions. It's not about doing evangelism. It is who he is. God is missional. We are meant to embody the character of God, and as we walk out into the world, we are meant to be missional ourselves. And so let's remember, God chose the context of a meal to reveal his first miracle to his disciples. He fed the hungry physically, and he fed the hungry spiritually, and he used the occasion of meals over and over and over again to do that. Bread and wine, a cup of coffee, something simple. It doesn't have to be big, but it does have to embody Christ and show his love to the world around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message today. We thank you for reminding us that we are meant to embody your character. Mission isn't just something we do because mission isn't just something that you do. Mission is something you are. It is a part of your character. And we're meant to be the same way. So help us as we leave these doors today and we go into the workplace and go into our families and the coffee shop and our jobs and wherever else we go. Help us to see the opportunities for evangelism. Help us to see the opportunities that you place before us to just embody your son and to spread your love. It is in your son's name that we pray. Amen.